In the heart of the state of the art, at the dawn of the next stage in entertainment, you found no proscenium. indeed found no proscenium the voice of everything immersive i'm your host noah nelson and welcome to episode 435 of our ongoing exploration of the immersive cosmos this week on the show no pro chicago curator patrick mclean hops into the host chair for a conversation with miguel angel rodriguez co-executive director of chicago's own albany park theater project and janine willett co-artistic director of the New York City-based Third Rail Projects about the two companies' ongoing collaboration over the years and its current incarnation, the immersive theater experience Port of Entry, which invites you to step inside the real-life stories of immigrants and refugees from all parts of the world living side-by-side in a single apartment building in one of the country's most diverse immigrant communities, Chicago's Albany Park. Performed by the Teenage Company of Albany Park Theater Project for just 28 audience members at a time, the production is currently in its sold-out spring run. Patrick will have all that for you in a moment, but first, let's check in on the Patreon, shall we? Thanks to the arrival of Third Donkey... Yes, that's the name we have, folks. We are now nine backers away from the magical 450 paid backer mark at which I will take a month off from shilling for the Patreon on the podcast. Not only do backers get the newsletter and access to our Discord, but they also get early access and discounts to events like the LA Immersive Invitational Showcase coming up on April 21st, which we expect will sell out this weekend, and the, which is not the weekend that's happening, it's, it's the weekend before, and the world premiere of the Broken Bone Bathtub documentary featuring a live Q&A with artist Siobhan Lachlan at Thymeli Arts in LA on May 18th, note the changes, tickets for which are going on sale to backers today. If you're not yet a backer, well, Friday, well, that's when I'm recording this Friday morning. Uh, yeah, any more, more on the Friday morning recording in a second on the other end. Anyway, uh, if you're not yet a backer, head over to www.patreon.com slash no proscenium and join up. Please, please, please join up. Get access to the newsletter and our discord and rest assured in the knowledge that you found a way to shut me up for a while. As always, big thanks to our sustaining backers, Samuel Mystery, Chris Bullman, Samantha Davison, Eric Shamlin, Elaine, Daryl, John Bullett, Cameo Wood, Jay Bushman, Jerome Joseph Gentis, Kurt Collins, Ryan, David Bassick, Richard Ayers, Lonnie Hanson, Lecker Lacool, the Ministry of Peculiarities, Jan Budman, and joining our sustaining backers, Tome Wilson. Thank you, Tome, so much. We're also, as always, on the lookout for community partners who are up for working out special deals like Siobhan did for our backers. Hit me up at noah at noprosinium.com for details. More than happy to work things out. Hi, everyone. This is Patrick McLean, No Pro Chicago curator and remote experiences editor. For those not well acquainted with Chicago, on its north side sits Albany Park. For several decades, this neighborhood has been reported to be one of the most diverse areas in the United States, housing foreign born residents from Latin America, South Asia, and the Middle East. And while serving as a new home and starting point for many families, these cultures have all one thing in common circumnavigating the intensely complex modern immigrant experience. And performing in that very same neighborhood is Port of Entry, an interactive dark ride experience capturing and recreating these residents' successes and struggles from Albany Park Theater Project and Third Rails Projects. And here with me to talk about Port of Entry are two of the creatives behind the experience. Starting locally, Miguel Angel Rodriguez is the co-executive director of Albany Park Theater Project, whose mission is to devise, quote, original plays that tell real life stories with honesty, imagination, intelligence, and love, end quote. These stories are performed by APTP's Performing Ensemble, which consists 
of young people of color from immigrant families. Miguel, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to chat about our project. Fantastic. Uh, also joining us today is Janine Willett, a co-artistic director with Third Rail Projects, which has been hailed as one of the most foremost groups creating site-specific, immersive, and experimental performances. Based in New York, Third Rail is best known for their long-running and award-winning experience, Then She Fell. But key to their mission, and I believe to this conversation, is how, quote, collaboration is integral to the work in the creative process, as well as in the partnerships with each new site, community, and cultural landscape, end quote, that Third Rail works on. Janine, great to have you on the podcast again. Great. Thanks so much for inviting me. So happy to talk about Port of Entry with you. Fantastic. And that's the funny thing is that before we get into Port of Entry, I would love to actually take it a step back because I think it's very important to talk about the history of both of your companies and then how they'll kind of came together in this kind of wonderful peanut butter and chocolate combination. But uh, I would love to definitely start about third rail projects and the history there and would love to hear more about um, that because as longtime listeners of the podcast know, no proceeding wouldn't necessarily be here. We wouldn't be here talking today if it wasn't for Then She Fell. Well, I think, um, so, you know, gosh, it was in 2014 when uh, Then She Fell was running. We had been running for about a year maybe. And uh, David Finer and Maggie Papadiak um, came to see the show. And, uh, and then later they wrote to us and it kind of came to our email uh, just asking if we would be interested in um, working potentially with with their ensemble, which is a youth ensemble in Chicago, and and so we got right back um, to them, and and then they came again and had a chance to hang out with Zach Morris, who's one of my co artistic directors, and some of the company members, and we just had this great opportunity where David and I had lunch in Grand Central when he was on one of his trips to New York, and. And we just kind of like hit it off. And, and I said, well, what, how would it, you know, work if maybe we could just come maybe a small group of us and teach like a residency for a week, like just like a six day or seven day, um, uh, you know, just collaborative, you know, teaching process where we could work together. And, and he, that seemed to be like a great idea. And it took us, you know, maybe a few months for that to happen. But then uh, the following summer, we, we had a chance to come to Chicago for the first time, and that was in 2014, and now we're a decade later. Uh, and, you know, you can imagine how that first six days went. It was incredible. And we realized that our companies were, like, cut from the same cloth, and we love to devise and to, to create things from the ground up. And it would just everything fell into place where all the questions we were asking about, you know, could a youth ensemble perform in immersive theater, it was like, absolutely. It was just like the most organic and natural thing. And, and we had such a fantastic time. And we actually, in just six days, we made like a, a showing and we invited audience. And a lot of the things that we made during that week became the foundation of learning curve, which we opened two years later. So it was just like this amazing runway. And, and the collaborations just keep going and our relationship just keeps getting stronger, you know, over time. Yeah. And I, I would love to back it up because I would love to hear more about uh, APTP's history because it, it's doing a very specific thing when it comes to the work it's doing and the communities it engages with both on and off stage to use kind of general terms. And I would love to hear more about that from you, Miguel, because I think a lot of listeners know about uh, Third Rail, but not necessarily about you all here in Chicago. Yeah. Um, so David Finer, my co-executive director, um, and I'll get to how, I, how I'm how i here today. Uh, David Finer and his late wife, Laura Wiley, um, who met, they both met at Yale, were really into device theater and really was looking for an opportunity to create theater in a community with its youth. And so... Laura, who is from the Chicago suburbs, knew that she wanted to return home and they landed, you know, serendipitously in Albany Park, as you started by saying, Albany Park has always been and continues to be uh, an incredibly diverse community. 
And so in 1997, they, they, they found themselves in church basements and classrooms across the schools in Albany Park, um, you know, bringing their practices of device theater and storytelling to, to the immigrant youth of this community. Um, I actually joined the company two years later in 1999. So in its infancy, I started as a freshman. Oh, wow. And one of the things that was and continues to be so appealing to a lot of the youth of our community is that Yes, theater is in the name. Yes, we do theater. Um, a lot of our kids um, come to APTP because there's no experience, no auditions, you know, required. Right? It's not part of the process. We're not a training program for you to, you know, for us to find the next Netflix or even Broadway actor. Right? We very much care about the ensemble experience. That includes, you know, telling stories and listening to stories and chasing after stories and being interested. And our associate director, Maggie Papadik, often calls the work that we do with our youth, you know, the laboratory. Someone brings an idea in and then we run after it and we go into the studio or or, 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 our theater and just start to create stuff. And so when we met Third Rail and that we came, we were ready, right? Our our team, our ensemble, our the way that we do things is very much saying yes and let's try things. So we've been around now for 27 years. April 1st is actually going to be our 27th year, um, our, our birthday. We've always done original life um, uh, plays based on the real life stories of our community. As you mentioned, we are an immigrant mm-hmm. generation um, a theater company. And so a lot of the stories, you know, while we're not always saying immigrants or identifying as immigrants, everything that we put on stage is through the eyes and lens of the people of our community. Again, immigrant and first generation folks. Um, we're much more than just a theater company, as I said, though. We're also a youth development organization. All of our ensemble members are paid. So we're, for many of them, their first paying job. Um, and for some, that's extra cash. So when they go off to college or post high school activities, they have something already in the bank. Um, for some, it's helped to help out with family and, and, and they're, you know, they're one of the breadwinners in the family and that's important to them as well. Would, um, would you say that that's like, cause I, I get really get the sense that's really incredibly integral to what you all are doing. And I'm, I'm wondering it does, I just guess I want to confirm, did that, was that always kind of there from the beginning or yeah, no. so it's kind of bloomed organically with the work as you progressed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I definitely, as someone who was in the company for four or five years, I definitely did not get paid. But, I, but I think that you know, I think that the money is not the reason why people come or why youth come to this company. It is just, it's an, a, a nice additional thing, and and they're right, right? Like they're spending so much time creating and performing and being here that they should be getting paid for their time. But, you know, 1997, 1999, Miguel came for the same reasons of the kids who are coming today, which is they want a community. They're looking for that community. They want other people like them, a space to be themselves and to rediscover or or to discover parts of themselves they never knew, right? Um, it's not, you know, it's it's not surprising to us that you would find people in our company who are queer or transitioning or just that safe space. And um, that may not be, you know, at school or sometimes even at home, right? So APTP, you know, and they cultivate it, right? Like we say yes to them being there and we say yes to their ideas, but because they're there, they are the culture of the, of the, of the, of the ensemble. And that's always been true, right? And that's why people come to our, our, to our space. And so we offer all the wraparound services that you can imagine a youth a nonprofit would offer uh, from mental health services to tutoring and academic services. We offer every senior free post high school conversations that includes a conversation about college and, and or a job. Um, so we really are, we invest so much. They are, they are our, our, our number one customers, right? Like all these adults and this show only can happen because we have youth who want to do this work. Right. And so we put all of our energy, our relationships with Third Rail and all the collaborators because our youth say, yes, these are the stories we want to tell. This is the work we want to do it's in service yeah. to them and their families and the community. Yeah. And I think that's and I would really want to talk more about kind of the, the work you had been doing previously for both of you with Learning Curve and yours truly, because I think uh I think some people might have the perception that Port of Entry kind of sprung out of the oasis and just appeared overnight in Albany Park. But this is part of a very long history about both companies 
uh, desire and the importance they put on community and telling diverse stories. And I would just love to kind of dig in about, we, we touched on learning curve very briefly in regards to the collaboration, but I would love to hear really honestly, I think, what is it like creating immersive exp work with youth, with, with people who are, we don't typically see within immersive experiences or in these type of engagements? Uh, well, I can, um, I can trace port of entry and learning curve going all the way back to that first lunch that I had with David. And we talked about, um, two different directions that we could go in to explore content. And one thing that one option was, um, education and what it means to be a high school student in Chicago, in a public high school, like that was a um, one area that we could explore. And the other was exploring the stories of families that live side by side in Albany Park. And in that moment, you know, a decade ago, we decided that education would be an, uh, the choice that we could use, that we wouldn't have to go out and do a whole lot of ethnography because every ensemble member was in the middle of being a high school student. And so we could just collect stories right then and there and, and use that sort of as a reference point since we only had six days together. And so we started with that topic and that was what we explored. And, and we were able to, you know, really run with what it means to create an experience, a storytelling experience that wraps the audience inside of the story. Like that's sort of the, the thing that I think our companies go together. We, we sort of fit so well together because storytelling is, is integral to both of our sort of um, points of inquiry of what we're interested in is sharing stories, creating mutual understanding, creating compassion and empathy in the world by having a chance to experience a story in a much more personal way. Mm. And one thing that we said was, well, you know, it's one thing to sit in the audience so safely and watch a play about being in a high school and how hard it is. And it's another to be given an ID and start in a classroom at a desk. And that's what we wanted to do. And it was like, that was so clear, like exactly how we could approach the storytelling model and who better to tell those stories than high school students who are in it, who were also playing adults and playing students. And so one of our big questions was, you know, can a, an ensemble who's a high schooler hold a room and play an adult for an adult audience? And we didn't know, you know, we came in and we're like, well, I sure, don't know. Yeah. I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> oh my gosh. They totally could. Like, it was absolutely amazing to see how they could step into the shoes and play a teacher or, you know, play um, a parent, they were able to shape shift and hold status with so much clarity. And so we kind of had our, our sort of proof of concept in that moment of like, absolutely, uh, they can completely hold that. And the journey, because it's coming from a place that has so much authenticity, it was really powerful for the audience. Um, and, and I think that was kind of what... Um, what we learned in those first six days that carried us to later, you know, when it came time that, that, you know, learning curve had a, about a seven month run mm -hmm. and we had a little, like maybe a year break. And then, you know, David was like, Hey, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, what do you think about, you know, working together again? And it was like, okay. <laughs> so, Twist we my went, arm. Yeah. Like, so we went back to that first conversation and it was the most natural choice to like, now let's tell the stories of the community, which is something that, that APTP, that's part of the mission of the company is to tell the stories that come from within the ensemble and their families, and then that stretch into the community on the whole. And so it was like a natural progression to now circle back and, and really dive into to that, that, you know, content and those stories. And I, I would love to dig in on a comment you made in regards to how, for lack of a better word, surprising it was that the the, the youths and the students were able to play older parts, 
play teachers, play parents, play grandparents, because I think when I saw Port of Entry, that was what was just so emotionally palpable and so impressive to me that their ability to inhabit these roles so believably, for lack of a better word, but then to really carry that confidence, like the some of them really like physically do that. And I would love for either of you, like, why do you think that is? Why do you think, you know, like we, we, we go see the big movies and Broadway plays and all these talented, powerful actors, but then here are these inexperienced, I'm doing air quotes, performers who don't have all that life experience and don't know Meisner and all those kind of techniques. And they're able to convey these important people in their lives and the pillars in their communities so almost effortlessly. Why do you both think that is or have thoughts? Well, the, the first thought that comes to mind is that they have the experience. They may have that. They may not have the age, right? But it's so mm. many of them have the experience of being from themselves being an immigrant, of themselves being a first generation, or bearing witness to the way in which their family, their grandmother, their lolas, right, the the, the people in their lives. Um, one thing that we 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 should mention as well: APTP has always um, cast uh, cross culturally, and so. You know, in the Mexican household, we know culturally that family is Mexican, but we didn't go out of our way to find every single Mexican cast um, ensemble member to put in there because we firmly believe that the immigrant experience, regardless of where you're from, there are so many similarities and there's so much care in the process and devising process of learning about an experience, a culture, a person that you may not share personally the same journey we spend so much time unpacking and getting the kiddos to to truly understand what this person is going through to maybe even unpack what is you know you know without without you know doing apples and oranges you know without trying to figure out the apples apples correlation but like what in your own experience you know when have you felt this way or what where where can you draw parallels from your from your home your your family's journey here so that that then becomes the best you are the vessel of telling the story but you are able to bring in yourself right your your own story your, your own family's experiences um and that's why that's you know we remind them often right we've gone now this is the third time we've we, we, you know, we, we open port of entry and every single time, even if you're coming back to a role, one of the first things that we do as an ensemble, um, as a cast, is we revisit every story. We revisit why we're telling the story. What is the story? What is the journey? Why does this movement, why was this movement created to, to show this? And I think that's so helpful, um, 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 for, for them to, to continue to, to, to channel these characters. I don't know, Janine, if you want to add anything to that. Well, I do. I Well, there's a couple things that there's, uh, from a perspective of, of immersive performance skills and, and also training, you know, um, I think APTPians have a tremendous amount of training and it might not be in this formal training that, you know, everyone's been in a dance school and everybody's been in an acting class there there is a sense of authenticity and importance in storytelling and embodying a character and sharing their story with a lot of integrity and that i think kind of is what comes out in the performance that you see like there's just this commitment to embodying a character and making sure that their story is told in the world and it's told really well and I think that that's a part of, of how, um, how we get to the, such a level of being compelling and honest. Uh, there's also, you know, it, from a third rail perspective, like part of our, our sort of magic spot is when we can get an audience to forget in just this little part of your brain that you're in a show and that we actually blur the edges between performer and audience. And so you really do in that moment feel that you are with that character. You're not with an actor playing the character. You are with the character. And there's something that I, I find the ensemble like just has that. And I, I think that's just a testament to the way that APTP's directors really like hold and cultivate artistry amongst their, their group. It's really unique. 
uh, and it's exceptional. And also it's just, you know, part of the the process, I think when there was an audition that kind of happened a, a few months ago and I looked at the call sheet and it was like, really what the audition was saying is we just want you to be a really kind human who wants to tell stories in the world. And that's all you need to be. You don't need to have all this training. We, we can get you that. It's this true desire to, to share stories and to be generous with an audience. That's what, what's at the heart of what we're looking for. And I, I think that like, I'd love to have that be like the rest of my life. That's, that's all that matters. <laughs> sure. You know, um, um I'm going to go off road for a little bit because I, I, I'm now because it, it sounds so much about the the process in which you engage these performers brings so much to the table. I would love to I would love to learn like what activities um, do the APTP like ensemble do in between performances and things like that. Like in regards to 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 reengage easily when port of entry returns for another set of run for X amount of weeks and things like that, because I, 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 I've really, you've both turned me on to this kind of beautiful thing that the work that is occurring on stage in port of entry really is happening all year, every day, 24 seven, almost in a way. Is, is that kind of the case? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like I said earlier, the, this show exists because the kids, the ensemble want to be there to tell their family stories. And so one of the things that we're, we're thinking strategically about is how to continue the APTP values in and out of the show. We care a lot about play. We believe that everyone deserves space to play. And so we find ourselves you know, in workshops where we're just rolling around the floor or being silly, because we believe that like, if this group truly loves the people around them, around them and themselves, that they're going to show up, as Janine says, and be embody these characters like this, right? Um, so we do a lot of, and we do, I mean, we do do training, right? You know, our, our staff, you know, we have movers on our staff, you know, uh, David, you know, went to Yale drama school. So we have people who are trained in all this. So like occasionally we might spot like, uh, Ooh, this is, this is beginning to feel a little like acting. Let's go back into the laboratory and get everyone to come and play and learn some skills so that they can apply it. Right. So they can apply yeah. it. Right? We just did, we, we actually did this. We just incorporated about 12 new high schoolers whose very first APTP experience is this immersive show. Um, can you only imagine like your high school self being like, I'm going to do a play. It's Port of Entry. It's immersed. It's, uh, it's a, Without the safety of like the, yeah. literally the proscenium, your parents, yeah. you know, they're like, one of them's got the camera on and everyone right. is not paying attention, but no, they're, they're right there in front of you. Oh my God. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And so we just did, you know, uh, and we knew they were ready. They wanted to be there. We had done a bunch of workshops where we've given them kind of a taste of a little bit of everything. And they seem gun ho. I mean, if you that space itself sells it, right? People want to be a part of something magical. Um, and then, um, so we did rehearsals. We just opened again and I started to do these uh, movement clinics and they're just essentially just ways for them to move their bodies, to learn vocabulary, to kind of do a lot of the stuff that Third Rail and APTP has been doing for the last 10 years, which is how to have a relationship with other human beings in space, how to really have a relationship with the objects in space and, and the world as a whole. So we've been doing stuff like that to, to keep it fresh, to learn skills that are used in the show. Um, you know, we're thinking a little bit long term. This is the first time we've done anything like this, right? So we're there's a lot of firsts here, right? The first time, now we're at the third time putting in a, a cast of people in. The third time having their real come from New York to help us put them together, right? So there's a lot of stuff that we're we're still, you know, we're learning as we're going. And one of the things that we're we're trying to figure out is we're not yet ready to open up something else while also having the show, but we are intrigued by the idea in the future that there is something else happening at our other space while this show is still going. We're not there yet. So please, please don't, don't ask us dates or anything like that. But, no, 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 no. You know what I, but that's, there's, that's there's, for the post show. People yeah. will know how to follow. We'll leave that be. But I, I am, because I think it's important. I would love to start transitioning and talking about Port of Entry itself because okay. you, you converted a it was formerly a storage unit space for a very long time in the actual neighborhood 
and you had a capital capital campaign and raised the funds and completely renovated it. So there's naturally go in, there's a small little lobby to get ready and things like that. But very quickly, audiences are ushered into a space to um, imply that they will be traversing a traditional Chicago courtyard building, like a nice U shape building that if you've been in it, to almost any urban city environment you've seen before in one way or the other, and then you wander the halls, both guided and directed by these youth performers uh, in character as tenants who are living there. And then essentially what happens is the audiences engage with group vignette scenes or have a one-on-one -on -one in a room or in a hallway and things like that. It's, it's, seemingly randomized but i you know you could for long-term uh, immersive fans and creators you definitely see where the the moments of interconnectivity to keep everything moving is going which i was really impressed about how hard it was for me to see that uh because sometimes i'm like oh you know you, you you see the person look for the cue like that's the person i'm taking which i didn't see which is another testament to those uh performers yeah <laughs> um but i would love to really like it's it's not, it's such a kind of stupid no brainer question, but like, how did you settle on that concept? The concept of the stories we talked about it. It's been a kind of theme throughout the entire collaboration between the two companies. But like to really dig in and how you maybe even picked some of these stories that are featured. And I I don't want to go into too much detail for spoilers' sake, but um because I get the sense there's an opportunity to change some of these stories as well, because there's so many stories that can happen in this building. There's so many different experiences that are constantly happening, and especially with current affairs, there are all sorts of tragedies worldwide that are occurring that are bringing people to city, to, to cities, to America, to this fictional um, courtyard building here in, in Chicago. So I would love it. It's both an easy but a very large question I've realized, and I've been stalling to hopefully give you both a moment to think about how you might want to respond. Um, <laughs> it's a great, I mean, it's a great question. And yeah. I want to be, I want to be both concise and like be able to bounce off of Janine with Janine. This is literally twenty-seven years of story gathering and telling. Mm. Right. So we, some of the story, we literally have a story that we got in nineteen ninety-seven one of the first company members is it is in the world right mm -hmm. um we've we've been just pulling and it's not like we we knew 27 years ago this was going to be the show that we're going to also include this story we've just been telling stories for 27 years and so when it came time to start filling the space we 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 if we can make a six hour show, we would have made a six hour show, right? There's just so much content there, right? And because we're trying to tell a hundred years of immigrant stories in an apartment building with people who are from all over the world, picking was was relatively easy, right? There's so much content there. And because the world is built almost modularly, right? If if in a year or two years we wanted to retire um, you know, a story or a home, we could, right? We could pack it mm -hmm. away for a little bit and we could, you know put the show on pause and, and then bring in, right? Like you're right. We're, there's so much that's continuously happening when it comes to immigrant and new arrivals in our, in our community and in the city, there's so much content out there that we still haven't tapped. There's so many people who are, who are not represented, who are currently living in Albany park. We just did not have the space, the rooms, literally the, the rooms, every, as you said, every inch of that space has a story in it. Um, and we're still putting in, you know, you know, stories here and there. The only other thing I'll add is, again, this is all student uh, ensemble member directed, right? Um, we work in collaboration. The adult artists work in collaboration with the youth. And so a, a question we often get is, how do we start? And one of the first ways that we started, oh. well, we, there are two assignments we gave. One was, will anyone let us come over? And so then the answer was yes. And we broke up into groups with some third rail, some APTP um, directors, even our designers, and then youth. And we went into people's homes. We 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 ate meals. We we drank tea. We we walked around. We looked at photos. Like we were, and we took a ton of photos, asked a ton of questions, and a lot of that. What what we experience is actually in the show, right? So that was one of the first one of the two assignments. And the other assignment was 
having people bring objects from home. Port of entry is is so much of, about the characters who are in front of you as it is about the space and the stuff that fills the space, right? How many times did you walk through that space, Noah, and that you you saw something that reminded you of something from your childhood or even from your own home? Um, and I just love that that was one of the ways in which we started the story gathering was bring something that's cherished and share with us. And then somehow that made its way into the home because someone's like, yes, we need Beanie Babies or yes, we need those rosaries around the doorknob. These are both true items that were found in people's homes. Well, because I, I, I would love to know because uh, one of the really kind of profound experiences I had was with a uh, a grandmother who walked down the line and tracking her her family history, essentially on the mantle was their life story in figurines and tchotchkes in personally made memorabilia are you you're telling me that that is potentially some of it or either actually is actually or simply inspired by what you all have seen and what was kindly shared with you Janine, do you wanna yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, well um so in terms of me, like, like Miguel said, there's 27 years of stories and, and transcripts and interviews. And, and then um, there's, there was so much incredible uh, content to choose from. So there was a, a process of like, you know, determining that what is the container for all of those stories. And so of course, home became, you know, a big, uh, a big, possibility and then thinking about like well a part an apartment building allows there to be you know homes side by side which also embraces uh, a unique element of albany park that that everyone lives side by side and so so this container was kind of what what um afforded the ability to sort of thread all of these stories and then to ultimately uh break them into different homes that that are inside of the the show and from an immersive perspective, like that container and, and, you know, those home visits really did build a lot of the layering of like what this space could be to, to sort of hold everything. And what would that, you know, uh, what would that look like? So um, th there is an interesting way. And I love how ABTP does this is like weaving different stories together in a really poetic and beautiful way that that can honor inside of one you know vignette can honor a lot of threads from a lot of people looking at um, similarities and sort of these repeating life themes and experiences that happen across many cultures and across many families and so it's finding those things that are relatable i think is the this door that opens up for the audience and sucks them right in they can see themselves reflected in some aspect of the story, even if the only thing is they know what it means to be a mother or they know what it means to be a parent. And now they're looking through that lens of relatability at a story that they would probably never experience in any other format in quite that same way. So so there's, there's something kind of amazing about that um, in terms of like, I think trying to tell a comprehensive story is impossible. You know, there's always going to be like more stories that that um, that haven't yet been told. And there's something uh, very interesting about the container we've built allows for the stories to change and grow over time. And so it wouldn't be unimaginable that a family might move out and a new family might move in. And there might be this opportunity for an entirely new uh, piece of the show to be created with ensemble members who then have a chance to devise and, and put their imprint on the content of the show. So it could go on, you know, I won't say eternity, Miguel, I don't know how, <laughs> but it could, it could just actually like go on and grow over time, which is really unusual for a show uh, to be able to, to have that. Well, and I think it's so interesting because it's definitely, there's in, in this experiencing port of entry and now in speaking to both of you, I, I'm very kind of fascinated about the sense of movement that is ever present, but then also very physicalized because yes, you're moving, like there's, you're moving through the space and things like that. Um, of course, as an audience member and being guided and things like that, but 
these are very active homes too. And I think another really kind of beautiful thing that occurred was at one point to bridge between two family units, we went out onto the back deck and then the, the, the children were just chatting and things like that. And then that's how we just simply moved there and things like that. And I, I think it's kind of fascinating that it, it just don't, I feel like an idiot, like in the sense of like, Oh, it's a play about like people moving and like taking risks and always having to be on the go. And that's exactly what I'm doing too. And incorporating that. And I guess this is nice to be like, Oh, this was very intentional. And I think that's very well done and a true Testament to this experience. And I think that really adds a lot because were there any concerns about the stories you were telling that you were sharing? I, I, I'm sure you both companies were very due diligent about like explaining what you were doing and the consent in regards to sharing these stories and the um, what would be depicted and how, but I'm just curious from like that mindfulness of an audience perspective, were there any, concerns in regards to like is this a story should we be telling is this a story that needs to be told are we telling it correctly like even further i'm just thinking that whole gambit of ideas um because mm. i i think there's such a beautiful intentionality in regards to the experiences and the lessons learned for kind of a lack of a pbs kind of way of the, the subject matter but i think it's the world we live in today, I think it's ever important to realize that we are all interconnected, which you've been open talking about. And that while you haven't been able to highlight yeah. every ethnicity or every race that has immigrated here, it's about like the family unit can be, well, it can be from a great many places and that's not unimportant, but it's important to show like we're all in this together. Yeah, I love that. I love that um, that summary. I think one of the things we released ourselves from a long time ago is that we were going to represent the immigrant experience, right? That these are, this is an immigrant experience that many people can relate to. Mm -hmm. The concern around, are we getting it right? I don't think we've ever had because we have people we've had many of the, sh the pieces that we have or many of the stories in the in the world the storyteller was still performing with us um when we created the scene um maybe not in that in that particular home or that scene but they were there they were able to to see how much care and and tr and to, to be able to trust that the company and the directors and their peers we're, we're taking care of them and taking care of that story. And also there's a little bit of releasing that once you've t shared your story, your story might evolve and might, might, might change a little bit, might even change, might change perspectives a little bit. Not because we want to, we're trying to figure out a different story or lens, but because, because, um, you know, I guess I should also just say that some of the stories are, some of the world is, um, direct pull from one person or a composite or a, a, a family and some are composites right as janine says some of them are like um i'm thinking of one home in particular that janine and i were on that's actually i can't count how many people shared something that's in that home and that goes from the the, the lines the scenes and so after a while when you come and see it you you might be able to recognize your story or your lines um but but i don't know if people if any of our storytellers are so stuck on, on seeing a direct translation of their words to the stage. And if so, that's not what we do. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we want to represent the story. We want to represent the essence. We want to represent the journey. We want to represent the struggles and the successes, but we're not always going to do a one-to-one -one comparison. No, I, I think, I think that's important. And I, I really appreciate you clarifying that because I, I just think it's, I, I am a, 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 a straight white man and to go into this, I had a very profound engaging experience and I would just, I, and I, I, I would just, you've talked about how the community is reacting through the performers and I, I and that's so refreshing, everything you said, but um, for either of you. What has been the response from the Albany Park community, from the people who are living 
next door to this experience and things like that. Um, but well, how do they feel? Uh, I, and I, I, this makes me, it's like I'm asking you to speak for the, uh, all of these communities and things, but I would, I think that's so important in regards to this conversation, the story you're telling with Port of Entry is about that representation and getting it correct. I'm using air quotes uh, and doing that. So has the community really resonated with this piece? Yeah. Yeah. Can I just like two quick little anecdotes? Um, Please. Yes. The, the short answer is yes. People who live in the community, the families of our kiddos, the, 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 the people who serve the community through the work that they do, um, residents, they've, they've seen it, love it, right? They, they're just so happy that there's a theater company in their community telling their community stories by the youth of the community. Mm-hmm. Um, I was standing outside and we're at a storefront on a major thoroughway between uh, several restaurants, uh, laundromats, you know, in one direction and like a dollar general in another direction. So like we get a lot of action, right? Just in the front and we have these big windows and, and this really awesome advertisement, advertising for the show. Um, and before we had this awesome advertisement for the show, we had this really awesome mural that was commissioned um, one of our ensemble members who is currently in art school in New York. And it's, it's a bunch of little boxes and, 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 and little miniature people from all over the world wearing their cultural clothes and the flags all over. And it was just, it was great. Um, it was up there for a while, right? While we were building out the show. It's kind of our way of clo- covering the windows so that you couldn't see the, you know, the dust inside. And I was outside once just like waiting for a package um, and uh, a community member walked by and pointed to the flag and said, that's where I'm, that's my flag. That's where I'm mm-hmm. from. And there was just, and then, you know, we got into a conversation about what we do. And, you know, I was able to say like, we're, we're here telling stories from that part of the world here in this, in this building by people who look like us. Right. And so that's incredible because that happens a lot. You know, people are constantly peeking in or curious or seeing the website and seeing immigrant, you know, seeing Albany Park seeing um you know play all written on our windows and so they come and then see that this is happening here in our community and they don't have to necessarily leave it to hear those stories the second story is you know we we work with a lot of schools um one of the ways that we recruit our kiddos is that we go into schools to offer um uh, low cost or free programming inside of their schools essentially doing it exactly what we do outside of the the um schools by creating original live performances that they get to perform in front of their classmates and their teachers. Um, and we've been doing this for 15 years. Um, and the kids who really like it will then end up joining ABTV. But, it, you know, some people will just do it once and then they're, they're over with. And we started a new relationship with the new school this year, partly, you know, because there's been um, an influx of migrants in our community. And we heard they were going to the school and we were just thrilled by the possibility that we could be part of their first American experience, that ABTP could be, you know, the, the play and storytelling, ensemble making, all these skills that you learn in theater and improv and uh, that that could be useful as you're transitioning to a brand new place, make, trying to make friends. And so we got in, we worked with the school. It's been awesome. We're still with them. And the principal came to see our show and she just came out in utter tears. She was just devastated. Mm -hmm. She was just ruined by the show in in a good way. And she just shared that she had been having a really tough time trying to figure out what else we can do for this this migrant population at her school. We can't change their circumstances. We can't change you know, where they came from or, you know, we, we, she feels like she's done everything she possibly could. And what she was missing was what she got from the show, which is the reigniting of this is important that this, this is where they are now is only one part of the journey. And can you just imagine them in a year or two or three years? Um, and because of that, we now are going to bring three full audiences of teachers to come see the show at no cost to them to ensure that teachers in our community are, are hearing these stories, right? We often are asked from teachers, I don't know my students. I don't know how to, I don't wow. know their experiences. Um, and, you know, by partnering with us, we, we show them exercises and, and ways to, to engage, you know, students' experiences um, as a way to activate the lessons that they're learning in school. And so we're hoping by bringing them to see this show and see actually seeing youth that, from their schools that they're reignited, that they're electrified by 
by the future, <laughs> by the future, you know, politicians and teachers and, and whatnot. No, I, yes. I, that, that's, yeah, that's wonderful to hear. <laughs> Important to hear too. And I, I think, you know, to kind of maybe start winding down our conversation together is that I would love to kind of talk about that, the future, like, so it sounds like you're continually expanding to new hidden audiences that maybe really need to engage that. So I would love to hear from the, from the both of you here, like, what do you hope the future of port of entry can do, like, what it will do and what, what occurs from it? Um, and I, and I don't mean, of course, practically like how long it'll run and when this extension will care that that's here nor there. I'm talking about the continual growth of this experience and the, com the many different communities it's reaching. I could start, but then Miguel, I feel like you have a really great sense from the inside of APTP. Um, there's, there's so many different, uh, branches that, that, um, the ways that port of entry can reach different communities is very broad. And even inside the way that the show itself has these built in uh, structures. So even from the time that it opened last summer, more ensemble members have joined and the youth who created the show and they were part of the devising process, which means that in that devising process, they, they dig into the transcripts, they dig into the themes and the essence of what we're trying to communicate in a, like a really deep way. It's not like, oh, we're going to look at a script and we're going to all play a part. It's more like we're going to build and create the script together. And like for one scene, for example, I, when I was there recently, there's a new one-on-one -on -one that's getting created. And, and like there were about maybe 15 of us in the room, 15 ensemble were creating bits and pieces of that one-on-one -on -one. and we like walked around the building and watched everybody's work and it was like amazing to see how many hands were creating that story and how the walls were covered with all of the themes and all of the struggles and all the things that are really important inside that story that need to be shared uh, that was like a pretty amazing educational experience it's I can't think of that many educational experiences that exist in 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 the world. Like it's a pretty Absolutely, amazing yeah. way to be creative, to, to unpack themes in a way that maybe you might do that in your English class, you know, but, but it's really deep. And, and there's a lot of like, um, of discussion in, in the group, like we're, we're coming through and, and coming to these conclusions as a group. It's not like adult led, it's really led by, by the teens. And so thinking about how that educational experience can kind of live on with every new ensemble member that comes in, they're getting pulled into that fold. And then for every one who knows the show, there also is this other layer of gifting your role to someone else. And so when you gift your role, you're also basically handing over sort of the DNA of that role and where it came from. And you become a teacher in that moment. So that's another like phenomenal learning experience that, that, you know, you don't get to have that often as a young person. So, so there's just like a lot of, a lot of potential, I think for the show and even just the model of how the show was made and how it goes on, you know, to be replicated and, and to use that as, as a way to kind of use theater to change the world in like a really, you know, great way from education to experience to, um, to even just, you know, the performance skills uh, of an immersive show. We've always joked about it, but it's exceptional social skills. That's really all it is. It's yeah. deep oh, yeah. <laughs> your audience adapting in the moment and, and responding authentically to what they're doing in that moment. Like those are things that like you carry that with you in your life. And if you can learn those things and you can carry them, they apply to everything. Like how, how great would it be if the whole world could practice listening to each other and like responding authentically, <laughs> like, like that's, you know, that's a pretty cool thing. So. I love that. And I think that um, I was thinking about how this show is a vehicle for our ensemble. I just had lunch today with one of our ensemble members who we met as an eighth grader and now is, Ooh, he's a sophomore about to go into his junior year. I'm thinking of Ruben, Janine. Um, and I asked him what he wanted to be when he grew, I was up. Um, and he's like, I want to be an immigration lawyer. 
Um, and I was like, that's terrific. I like, it was like, I would love to hear more about this. And, you know, he could change his mind and should probably change his mind 30 more times because we've all done that. But there's something about helping the youth. We haven't done this yet, right? Because we, we've been in show, show, show mode. But there's something about turning the lens to the youth development aspect of our organization and helping the youth to stamp everything you just said, Janine, to show them that the, the things that they've been working on to perform in an immersive theater show is very sophisticated and they've learned so many skills so helping them to codify for themselves like what are those things and how can you apply it outside of this space if you haven't already um so definitely there's a lot there that we we're we're in the, we're, we're cooking a couple of things and then and then just to turn it out there's still so many things that we haven't done with the show that is an and situation right so how can we bring these teachers in and also offer trainings on uh, on the immersive skills, let's say, so that they can then apply that in their classrooms to teach the lessons they need to teach, right? Or yeah. what is, you know, we have this awesome lo- lobby space in on a major thoroughway. What can we be doing more not in the show in that space to ensure that the community members who are needing immigration law support can gather in our space? Or the community, another art, a roving art exhibit could come in like set up in our space so that there's something to be done, you know, like, so that there's art always happening in that space activated. So we're just excited for, for endless possibilities of, of, of how this show could be the vehicle for additional community engagement and, and youth leadership. Um, And so we're just, we're, 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 we're letting the dust settle right now from, well, that's the, Actually, there's no dust. We're letting our <laughs> we're letting ourselves relax a little because we just came off of an awesome a rehearsal process, and we just don't want to jump into something else. But we are really beginning to start thinking about um, now that we know what the model is for always rehearsing new people into the show and getting the show up and going. We're now thinking about these other, you know, other activities we could be doing with the show. No, and I love that. I love the pos- ending on such a wonderful note of positivity for like forward thinking. And I think we all could, maybe that's all something we could stand to hear and listen to and receive. Um, Janine, Miguel, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a true delight and I really greatly appreciate you both making the time to chat with me today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah, of course. Pleasure. Once again, I want to thank Patrick for hopping into the host chair and to Miguel and Janine for being our guests on the show this week. Check the show notes for more about Albany Park Theater Project, Third Rail Projects, and Port of Entry. I wish I could say and for links to get tickets, but that thing done sold out um, like before they even put tickets on sale. They they actually had a lottery for tickets for the spring run. Uh, because that's that's how it rolls um very very hot ticket there in chicago um also speaking of hot tickets uh i'll just talk real quick uh yes we've got i think last check we had about six tickets left for the invitational all for the last show uh i know that there might be a, a couple of um a couple of tickets may come out for the other shows mostly because we keep on inviting people to come in and help work <laughs> they're like i already bought a ticket so there might be one or two tickets probably probably never the same show uh popping up uh in the next few days so keep an eye on that uh but yeah we are we're we're in a good we're going to position yeah good position there um and and we're going to do some recording at the Invitational. And I think I'll get, you know, I think I'm going to talk Graham. Uh, Graham does not know this. I'm saying this live right now. Uh, I think I want to get Graham uh, to talk about, like, the business fundamentals of, of running this thing. Uh, even though, like, we, we, uh, no one's making money. <laughs> on this uh like this one's being done for the love of the game uh and and it's not intended uh, it's not supposed to be uh break even is is what uh, the aim for this one is uh and you know i think it's good doing even with a soul out i think it's good to do a little bit less than break even but we're gonna have some good things from making those choices it's about choices people it's about the long game 
Um, okay, this is usually part of the show where maybe I'd like talk about things like all, oh my gosh, like Ever- Evermore is closing. It's like, mm, yeah, whatever, sure. Um, <laughs> sorry, that was really dismissive. Uh, yeah, the news broke last week that like Evermore is officially closing up. Um, color me not shocked. I <laughs> let you know what you want to be real. I thought it was already closed. I didn't realize it was still open. I thought it was gone. So, and I'm me. Like my job is to know these things, and I thought it was done so a long time ago. Like that thing failed to launch, and I I don't say that with like you know, woo glee. I'm so glad to see this thing. I, I just I gave up on it a long time ago. Is what I'm saying. Like I when that thing was announced, I was like, wow, someone's swinging for the fences. And then, and I really love the void. And so I was like, wow, the creatives involved in this are really cool. And this is some nifty ideas. And then a friend of mine went and explained to me what the experience was like. And I was just like, what are they thinking? Why are they doing it like this? Um, and, and maybe there were some changes in tack at some point, but when, when that friend went, they were like evolving the storyline week to week. And I'm like, why? Why? Because you look at Ghost Town Alive, they evolve that storyline year to year. You look at Phantom Peak, they do it. They change the scenario every season. All that stuff makes sense because you want different people coming through. You evolve something week to week, and what you're basically saying is like, hey, we're we're a we're a regional LARP company, which is great don't spend small theme park money building a a regional LARP experience that, that is like a weekly game. Like, and anybody can tell you that. So yeah. Um, I don't get worked up when things that are just kind of like, sounds like someone's having fun. Uh, go to the wayside. I, I, I can't, I can't emotionally invest in that sort of stuff. I can't, I can't bet the farm uh, of, of the industry on that. I guess this is the part of the show where I talk about things like that. Uh, I thought I wasn't going to, because right now they're using chainsaws on the other side of the building, about 200 feet from me. They're tearing down the tree. The squirrels hang in. I like squirrels. Um, I also like that tree. Don't like all the sticky pine residue it puts everywhere. I don't know why that tree was there, but they're tearing it down. That's one of my trees. And I'm like, "Mm." maybe they're not going to tear the whole thing down. Maybe they're just going to prune it back. It still chainsaws on a Friday morning while I'm trying to record. So, yeah, it's been one of those weeks. Um, The newsletter is going to be huge. Uh, Catherine keeps swirling things away into it. Uh you like like that's 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 Catherine's uh squeaky scrolling things uh that's that's literally Catherine's Catherine's day-to-day function uh vis-a-vis no pro whatnot there's a bunch of stuff that that her contract doesn't allow her to do uh but but she she just packs away um stuff into the newsletter through the EI interface um in fact she told me that she's the one who made sure there were 14 things for the past couple of weeks and I'm like oh man someone was pranking me Anyway, uh, we have fun here. <laughs> we have fun. I'm holding on to my coffee like it's the only thing that's keeping me alive because it probably is. And uh, yeah, it is a week away to the LA Invitational. Uh, I hope to see a lot of you there. Um, I know I know I'm going to see a lot of you there. Uh, I know a few of you who I'm not going to see there because like they made other plans. Boo hiss. Um, and I'm just. I'm going to be so fascinated to see what comes out of it because it's just this black box. Uh, and yeah, uh, we got a nice run of shows coming up. A bunch of stuff's in the can, some really great interviews, some really lovely interviews are already recorded and uh, we're going to get those out to you. And Siobhan's premiere is happening on May 18th at Thymeli now. Um, uh, there was a venue change. Uh, that'll, that'll all make sense relatively soon. Uh, and yeah, um, I don't know what else to tell you at the moment. I'm going to go listen to Chainsaws and try and do the newsletter and my taxes. <laughs> I hope they're done soon. The associate producer of No Persinium is Parker Sella. 
Music for No Proscenium is by Chris Porter of the Speakeasy Society and Solar the Podcast. Special thanks to Siobhan O'Loughlin for voice here intro. The No Pro Podcast is written, edited, hosted, produced, and mixed by yours truly, Noah Nelson. And until next time, I'll see you at the show.